I'm absolutely sick and tired of the lies and deceitful nature of the crypto industry. The people who are spewing the wrong information or couldn't be bothered to do some basic research. Guys, I am here today to explain to you why some of the most popular altcoins are doomed to fail. This is not clickbait. This is me not exaggerating this point at all. Okay, I'm being 100% serious. And the only thing I gain out of this is for you to be more financially independent and to make more educated decisions as to why or why not you should invest in the projects you are. Now, of course, I'm going to be calling out some projects today in my usual fashion, just because while I'm not directing all the hate and attention to them, it does span to a very wide number of projects. I'm going to use them as examples. So don't go hate on particular communities. And if you own any of these cryptocurrencies, please don't take this personally. The only thing I'm gaining from this isn't FUD. I mean, I'm in the market too. I just want you guys to be financially independent. That's the whole goal of the channel. So let's not waste any more time and get into the video. So just to send that message home yet again, you're buying altcoins that are doomed to fail. I know this word sounds quite crazy, I must admit, but I'm not wrong. Give me the time to explain to you why. And look, you won't find experts or influencers talking about this. There are a select few influencers like Justin Bonds, for those who are on Twitter. You know this guy, I love him. He says it straight how it is and he's factual and honest. He's one of the very few that actually do this, but even you know, influencers won't wanna do this. Why? Because of scrutiny. As someone in the public eye, when you start playing with people's financial uh, situation, when you start talking badly or honestly about a certain project because someone has money in that, right? When you mess around with people's money, health or family, it tends to go quite uh, sideways, right? So. It's a very touchy subject, you know, pretty much poking holes in their beloved projects where they have all their money. So that's the re one of the reasons. And of course, it goes against the narrative. What's crypto all about? Crypto is about decentralization. This is going to kind of wrap back in just a second. So we're kind of going against the narrative here and just being straight up honest. Okay, so I personally would rather be honest with you. And so you knew the 100% truth. Again, so you were the most aware. Again, I am here to help you. I'm here to put in the work and ethic and the time, which most of you don't have because you, you, know, you have regular jobs. So I'm here to present you with the facts. And that is my main purpose. I gain more losses from being from lying to you essentially, right? So most of this has to do with da -da -da -da, proof of work networks, right? Like Bitcoin, Casper, Kadena. Monero, Flux, et cetera, et cetera. But, and here's the big but, before you dismiss this, it's crucial you listen to what I'm about to say. I must admit, all these networks aren't bad. Let me just say right now, all of these networks aren't bad, but it's what goes into them. Now, I've got to say, before I get into any of the points I'm about to, guys, their businesses, at least most of them on this list, they you know, run by foundations, things can be upgraded and changed. Even Bitcoin can be changed. So I want to make that very clear. This isn't static. It's not here forever. So there's two main issues with proof of work networks that everyone needs to know. If you choose to ignore these issues, that's fine. Go ahead, right? But I'm going to say right now, you are going to get a hefty reality check. Now, the interesting thing is, this isn't just proof of work. This can apply to proof of stake networks, proof of authority, any networks out there, because the issues are primarily focused with proof of work but trust me right now there are some really bad proof of stake networks doing this when they really don't have to be doing this okay number one what's the main issue number one it's centralization so this one's going to require a little bit of reading here for me but let me say right now this is integral especially if you don't know too much about bitcoin and how the whole bitcoin system works or proof of work systems work in general right so proof of work networks are extremely centralized opposed to what many people believe again we're going against the status quo here right so this includes bitcoin very very centralized networks but the reason they're so centralized isn't that there's few nodes or nodes in very small uh, areas of the world right it's because the very algorithm that secures it is fundamentally flawed here's why proof of work networks require computational resources to mine the blocks that's blocks with transactions in them which usually comes from gpus or cpus depending on the algorithm right now the process behind mining a block is called hashing, okay? And it's where the machines need to find a specific number called a nonce, but I don't want to confuse you guys. Let's just say a special number via, you know, just a whole bunch of mathematical equations all at once, okay? And essentially the fastest computer wins and they're rewarded by mining the block, what's called mining the block, and they get the block reward. Right now with Bitcoin, it's like 6.75 or 3.125 uh, Bitcoin per block or something like that, right? However, this is the fundamental flaw. If there is no cap for how fast these machines can be, the so-called hash rate that I was explaining before, or essentially how many guessing attempts a miner can take at completing the mathematical equation 
per second will continue to increase as fast the machines are added, right? So this will make a little bit of sense in just a second. This is because the algorithm itself sees that the machines are getting faster and increases the difficulty. So these proof of work networks to ensure that, hey, if I'm someone who creates like in the future, like 2030, I might create a really fast machine and I might use that to get all the block rewards possible. Well, the algorithm can see that and then it increases the difficulty. So there's no point in, you know, someone trying to create new next gen machines. Well, there is obviously you get more blocks so it's faster, but the hash rate will go up. So this is why it tends to always increase. If you look at hash rate charts, especially with Bitcoin, you'll see it increasing like this because machines are getting faster and then the algorithm goes, okay, so we need to make it more difficult to do this, right? And this is where we get to a point where we need specialized equipment to run the algorithm itself, to process these blocks, right? And this is essentially where we come with ASICs. So ASICs are application specific integrated circuit miner or just really, really fast purpose-built machines designed to mine a specific cryptocurrency, right? This one over here is designed to mine Bitcoin. We have ones for Kadena. We have ones for Dogecoin, right? And this unit alone is 36,000 US dollars for one, one of these machines. And I know all about this because I was about to set up a Bitcoin mining farm at one point, right? So very, very expensive. Nevertheless, these things cost a lot and have slowly begun to centralize networks because they are so hard to obtain, right? Who has that much money floating around for one of those machines? They are expensive to buy and also run with electricity. Uh, yeah, they got a long time to pay themselves off. You know, they take sometimes years to pay themselves off. As you can imagine, you'd have to be very lucky to, to run one of these machines and get the block reward, okay? This is the reason why many people opt to buy them and ship them off to companies to run them on their behalf, like mining pools, um, even in physical locations, because these things, believe it or not, are extremely loud. I think it's like the equivalent of like running a, a vacuum cleaner 24 seven, right? And it's also the reason why companies have begun to monopolize markets. Let's take Bitcoin as a prime example here. So early Bitcoin adopters and mining farms have been able to compound profits so much that they now control most of Bitcoin's hash rate. Now this means they are the ones most likely to make money from the network and they're going to be growing even more. They can obviously take profits in a bull run, buy more of these machines because they're cheaper in a bear market and just compound and compound and compound, right? And that's obviously very, very central. And what happens when we centralize things? Well, they can take over the network, double spend, reverse transactions, so on and so forth, right? So it takes 51% of the Bitcoin in most other, you know, proof of work networks, even proof of stake networks, hash power to then control the network, right? So what happens here? Well, this is a screenshot today of Bitcoin's mining pools, all the pretty much hash rate divided up into these pools. And Foundry and Anpool make up 50.6%. Remember, 51% is required to come together, collude, and then do whatever you want with the network. You have complete control at that point, right? So it was actually at almost 52%. It was over 51% about a week ago when I last reviewed this and I have the screenshot to prove it, right? So, wanna know the crazy part of all this? Wanna know why this is extremely bad? Because networks like this are so centralized, it's extremely easy for governments to also shut them down. So, in addition to them being extremely centralized, governments can now shut them down, right? Because you need massive mining farms and when there's massive mining farms, they're in a central location scattered around the world. If the governments collude and say, we're cut cutting this off, they can do that guys very easily. And if they cut off most places in the world, what's gonna happen then, right? So all in all, we're gonna wrap around to why this is important in a second into the specific projects I wanna mainly talk about. But what I wanna say here is people always crap on proof of stake, right? Because the, wealth, the wealthiest man wins. Now there's different uh, variations of proof of stake, but nevertheless, the ultimate problem here is the wealthiest man wins. You just put your money in, you get more of a chance to, you know, mine the block essentially, right? But what people fail to see is the same situation is playing out for proof of work, yet a lot worse, a lot worse. First, the centralization of money to afford the machines. That's like you're, you're putting your money into the proof of stake network. Well, you got to buy machines now, right? You got to buy the hardware. That is just the same in my opinion. Then the difficulty of maintaining the machines, you have to actually maintain them. They are hardware. They can you know, uh, if it's too humid, for example, which is one of the problems I had in Australia when I was looking at this, you have to obviously have them constantly maintained, right? There's loud noises. The fact that you're forced to join a mining pool, which then has fees. So if you want to have it in your room, the chance of you getting the next block is like one in astronomical numbers. So you're forced to join a mining pool, which obviously then it's the, you know, that reward is divided up into everyone in the mining pool. And then you may even need to send the miner to another location altogether physically, right? So proof of stake can create mechanisms to help prevent this, but actually so can proof of work. Now, Flux is a perfect example of a proof of work network that has created a threshold 
for the hash rate, right? So it's gonna kind of get rid of the need for ASICs. So there's a threshold for it, right? It's gonna prevent it from getting out of control and therefore you can have anyone. I can run, you know, one of the miners on Flux with my GPU, for example. I won't even need to use my CPU, right? And so on, so on and so forth. So there are ways to prevent this, which is really good to look at and, and observe, obviously, but that's only half the problem, right? So here's the second issue with networks like proof of work, for example, right? And that's ESG. So many of us should know how important the environmental narrative is for the world right now. I believe there is an agenda happening, but that's you know for a whole different video. You guys might call me a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist if I go into that in this one. But companies are more and more forced to clean up their act when it comes to climate change and fossil fuels. And so obviously I think you can see where this is all going, right? Proof of work is going to be slammed because it's not environmentally friendly. As long as it's proof of work, it is not environmentally friendly, period, right? A proof of work network that wants to attract enterprises in Web2 are forced in for a serious reality check rather, right? So this is ESG. It's very important you pay attention to this next part right so environmental social and governance we're mainly looking at one aspect here which is the environment so this is a narrative being forced upon the institutional web 2 world where companies are rated on their exposure to long-term environmental social and government risks the risks involve issues such as energy efficiency worker safety and uh, board independence right but they do have financial implications so this is the esg rating chart right here and uh, so obviously you know being a triple a or double a rating is the best possible case in a situation and you're only rated so if you kind of tick a certain amount of the boxes in each of those three you know environmental social and governance aspects but here's the real kicker okay because enterprises are obviously wanting to use this technology and it's becoming more and more apparent right here are some considerations for the environmental score that goes into it right so carbon emissions are enterprises going to want to reduce their carbon emissions yes so are they going to want to use a proof of work network to run their network or run you know host the back end no thinking about like the product carbon footprint itself uh, so the you know going into the supply chain for example financing environmental impact climate change vulnerability electronic waste right clean technology green building and renewable energy so yeah proof of work isn't any of those things but just hold on one moment a bad rating can impact a company something they obviously can't afford to do as time progresses right while ESG narrative is quite young and it's not as prominent as you might think it is it's definitely ramping up though it will begin to impact our altcoins moving forward and shouldn't be something and should be something we heavily consider before placing our investment. So let me ask you something. Why do you think enterprise slash mass market focused networks like Algo, uh, HBAR, NIA, VET, and even proof of work networks like Kadena, for example, are super heavy into being as green as possible? Well, it's to ensure they are a viable candidate for companies looking to abide by this narrative. So you have to remember this, guys very important this is a part of the narrative we have to confine ourselves or conform rather to this narrative moving forward if we go against the grain we're bound to get wrecked and you can't feel sorry for yourself in that case okay now i want to say there is an exception right there are proof of work networks that are limiting their exposure to this with carbon offsets partnering with climate change organizations or being efficient at scale like Kadena. Now, this is going to help, but it all depends on the degree in which they do this. So for Kadena, proof of work, okay? So, but, the, and then, you know, that's sort of the USP of Kadena is you can scale to 10,000 chains, but it's going to be even more efficient as you scale up, right? It gets more and more efficient, which is really unique. So it kind of scales in that aspect, which is awesome. Uh, and if they kind of go one step further and do, you know, offsets, so with all the fees, the transaction fees, they go and buy offsets. That's beautiful because they can be carbon neutral, which is obviously, uh, you know, enticing for these larger enterprises to go, okay, we might actually use Kadena. But the next question is, why would they even want to be susceptible for that? What if the fees on the network can't afford those offsets? So these are the things we have to think about, right? I'm not crapping on Kadena, for example, here, or Casper is one that I really have some big concerns with, and you guys should know that by watching my other video. So these are just things we have to consider and really think about. These are economics problems at the end of the day, right? So if you think I'm BSing you, go ask anyone in the real world about crypto. So I actually worked for a Web3 company that was helping create an NFT collection on Polygon. This is a true story, of course. And uh, what actually ended up happening is they wanted to create an NFT marketplace uh, and they wanted to sell these NFTs or at least offer these NFTs to music musicians, right? And then so what would happen then? Well, the musicians would then use these NFTs and then sell them. So it kind of created like this uh, artistic middle class where there currently isn't, right? There's either you either, you know, making heaps of money in music or you're making nothing, right? So it created this awesome middle ground. But what happened was when they were trying to onboard some of these artists, albeit not all, but some, they were saying no because, you know, 
no, you're using crypto. Crypto's not green, right? And so obviously you guys know musicians, a lot of them are, I'm gonna use the word hippie here. They are very conscientious about the environment. So there's a lot of feedback in that case. And even though they were on Polygon, there was still that negative association with crypto. So this is something very serious. And if this is something all the hippies and regular Web2 people are freaking out about, you can imagine what the enterprises are thinking. So the bottom line, enterprises are not gonna want to be known as the company built on a technology which is impacting the environment point in case or leveraging it for payments in any capacity, right? The repercussions for a company could mean being blacklisted from exchanges, publicly slammed, and most concerning as well, shareholders selling their stock, right? And before anyone goes ahead and says, look, Kyron, they can just buy carbon offsets, not the protocol itself, not like Kadena buying offsets with the fees. I'm talking about, let's say Kadena didn't do that and Kadena was actually like Bitcoin, for example, was consuming the energy in the world and a company wanted to leverage Bitcoin and they decided to buy carbon offsets that doesn't make much sense to me. Why? Well, because why would a company want to spend more money on offsets just so that they could use a network that is highly centralized and run by unknown parties and could essentially be shut down at any moment, of course, if they're ASIC. You know, ASIC machines require some level of centralization or at least over time. So the answer is no, they're not going to want to do that at all. It just opens up to so many doors when they could just choose a proof of stake network and all those problems never even existed in the first place, right? So if there was one proof of work network that I could possibly see surviving in the long term, it would be Bitcoin. But that's only because I believe the elites are going to want to extract value from it first. So very outlandish statements. I get it, right? This really only impacts those networks focusing on Web2 enterprises. However, I believe the ESU narrative is far too powerful for governments to want to ignore this. Bands like China could uh, actually come for, you know, these developed countries as well. And it's not a risk I am willing to take. Now, you probably will get some money out of these projects for 2025, and that's great. But I'm saying, especially moving forward, be very, very aware. Now, as I mentioned throughout the video, there are some good examples of this. Flux is ASIC resistant and uses proof of useful work, which doesn't waste computational energy, for example. And Kadena, it's energy efficient at scale, right? It's not ideal, but it's still better than regular proof of work. So guys, my main thing with this video is to introduce you to this idea, to this economics problem to this real issue that will plague these projects moving forward so for all you people saying hey my i'm not going to name names here my project's going to be fantastic it's proof of work it's design it's all this blah, blah 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 it's fantastic technologically and so on and so forth that doesn't matter if it's shut down because it suffers from these issues it don't matter guys so i'm telling you right now these esg narratives the environment it's just going to get more and more severe as we move forward and governments are becoming more centralized so again i'm trying not to really place too much of the shame on the individual projects here but you do need to be aware and I'm here to tell you the no BS truth. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. If you did find it valuable, hit the like button. And if you want more daily content, two videos a day from here on. So please subscribe for more. Take good care. Talk to you all soon. Bye.